I want to make three, three observations. And then I want to spend the rest of my presentation telling you how I came to those observations. So the first observation that I'm going to make is that I think we should be cautious about subsidizing or encouraging young farmers to enter or buy farmland in the present setting in some situations. And I'm just using the word cautious there. The second observation is that the issue of non-farmer ownership of farmland from the perspective of competitiveness, I think is a bit of a red herring. And the third observation related to the second is though it's a red herring, the benefits of ag policy, ultimately in terms of ag payments, get shared between producers who are typically the target of ag policy and landowners, many of whom are not farmers. So those are my three observations, and now I want to walk with you through the reasons and the basis for thinking that way. All right, so as JP pointed out, and I won't belabor the point, given the 15 minutes, but we can talk about this a bit more. In recent time, the last two or three years, we've seen a meteoric increase in farmland values. In Ontario, since 2010 to roughly the first quarter of 2013, around a 58% increase in farmland values. From the studies that we've done, we know that rental rates don't appear to have appreciated at that same rate. The other point that you can see from this graph is that there are differences in the magnitude of the values of farmland that vary across provinces. Moreover, we look at the present meteoric increase in farmland values with a recognition that, of course, there was a major adjustment in the 1980s, and I think that forms a bit of the backbone psychology of Canadians in the present environment. But and I've just indexed this same data that I showed you between Canada and Ontario just to emphasize the point that farmland values have been increasing in Canada and Ontario. There's a little bit of a separation there in, in 2011. But what we've seen in Canada, we've also seen in Indiana, we've also seen in Iowa. So the appreciation of farmland values is a phenomenon that's really occurred across North America but there is tremendous variation in these uh, magnitudes and rates of terrain changes across uh, the provinces uh, and, and across different areas within the province. Some of my remarks are when I'll focus in on particular aspects of Ontario, I'll really be looking at data from this region of southern Ontario. So for those of you who need a little bit of focus, that's where some of the data I'll show has come from. And that's important. If you haven't had a deep breath this morning, um, this is data from a particularly high-valued uh, area. So that, that is 17, 18,000 there in 2013 values for farmland in Zora Township. Now, you can get farmland in this region. Uh, Tom was just telling me about farmland that he's bought for 8,000 and 10,000. But the rates in Ontario in particular are quite high. Now, these changes in farmland values, of course, have coincided with expectations about in continuing increases in net farm income and, of course, expectations about the continuation of a low interest environment. But this price to rent ratio that I want to talk about now is, I think, useful to think about when we think about whether now is the right time to make a purchase. So, there's two, what, what you have on the vertical axis, this is a presentation that was just recently presented by Michael Bolge, a well-respected ag economist at Purdue University. And what he's doing is he's looking at the price to rent ratio when people buy, which is listed um, on the horizontal axis. So if, you, if the price, this is just as an example, the price of farmland was 10 and you could rent it for a dollar, that price to rent ratio would be 10. And he's comparing those price to rent ratios um, with the expected return of farmland. So when they bought 10 years later, what was the kind of expected return they had? And he's looking to see, he wants to compare the price to rent ratio at the time of purchase 
with the, the, the expected rates of return from farmland. I just want to draw your attention. When we get into this high price rent environment, historically, and this is data from Indiana, historically we've seen that the rates of return, and that's figuring in both rental rates and depreciation of land value, have been um, much, much lower. So the first observation that I have is, is this the time to be encouraging young farmers to enter the farmland uh, market in a time when we know that the price rent ratio is generally increasing? And my suggestion is that we should be cautious. So we understand that new entrants in a high price environment will be hoping for support from the government. Programs like FCC's new Young Farmers Loan Program is an example of that, but we should be cautious moving forward. And I just would note that in 1976, Dr. Balder Christensen had just taken over the FCC, and that's when one of, I think, one of the first beginning farm loan programs began. Now, that's of interest, of course, because we know what was happening to prices in 1976, and we know what happened, the great adjustment that happened during the 1980s. And I think this question of uh, what the appropriate policy should be and whether we should be subsidizing new entrants, it can, we can capture this in thinking about a broader approach to policy. And that is, um, you know, when I talk about ag policy, I often talk about not only are there actions required, but there's also the importance of forbearance. And that is the collective decision to restrain from action. And I think that's an important aspect of thinking about policy in these environments. And I think it's captured well by a statement that uh, Bill Davis, the long-standing premier of Ontario in the 1970s, once said, and I think he, he understood this issue of forbearance. He said, why put off till tomorrow what you can avoid doing altogether? All right, so that was my first observation. Let's be let's cautious. Now, the second observation with respect to competitiveness is that the concern about non-farmer ownership of farmland, which as I'll point out in a moment is widespread, is a bit of a red herring. So here's a statement that you might have seen yesterday. Certainly I've had reporters ask me that within the last year. So it's, it's, it's a statement that's, con that's expressing a concern about the rapid increase of land renting and the absorption of farms by wealthy landowners. Now you might have heard that yesterday, but it was said in 1897. And it was said in the format of deciding amongst economy at an economic, an association of, when the Association of Economics was starting, it was said by a group of people who wanted to set up an ag economics association. So it's a forerunner to the association um, that JP is the president of right now. And this was the kind of issue they were debating. So this is an oldie but a goodie. But it's in part coming around, part because land values are going up, but because we know both in the United States and in Canada that farm, that rent, the amount of land in being rented in is quite large. So roughly 40% in Canada in general. In Ontario, it's a little bit less, 32%. Manitoba, which I put up there as well, mimics basically the, uh, the, the uh, the, the Canadian data. And we know from surveys that we've done at the University of Guelph with my colleagues James Bryan and Alphonse Weersink, we know that the majority of that land is not owned by farmers. Right? So the, the, the piece of the pie that I've highlighted, we've interviewed, we have gone out and surveyed producers and we've asked them about the landowners that they rent from and only 10% were identified as farmers. Now, what we have tried to do is we've tried to examine how that would affect land, which is a very important, you know, it's an essential input into agriculture production. And so we've tried to look at rental rates across these different landowners. And you can see there is some variation these are just the raw figures, but when we've actually done regression analysis, um, we've actually found that uh, 
that there aren't statistically significant differences between these landowners. In other words, the rental rate is basically being set in a competitive market. So non-farmer owners of farmland aren't setting relatively higher rates. If anything, and this is one of the interesting things that you can see from it, you can see that farmers who, um, from an ag background, so here, charge relatively higher rates, though statistically, this was not a statistically significant result. But we have this issue. So that's my second observation, that non-farmer ownership of farmland is a bit of a red herring from the perspective of competitiveness. But this is a quote from a, a highly used policy uh, book on agriculture economics. And the question, what exactly is Andy Schmitz implying here? And I think the main point is that every agriculture payments get shared, and this is just the workings of the market, between producers and f farmers, many of whom are non-landowners. Sorry, agriculture payments get shared between producers and landowners. And here's some data from some recent studies looking at that effect. So in Canada, Richard Vine, who's here, has done a study in which he found that the marginal increase in agriculture payments increased as agriculture land values by around $7. A more recent study in the United States looking at agriculture payments shows that it gets capitalized into land dollars. The marginal value gets capitalized at $13. So the key point is that, that I want to make is that the current environment, we've seen an increase in the price to rent ratios, and I think that suggests some cautious in subsidizing uh, investment or purchase of farmland. The second, from a competitiveness perspective, I don't think non-farmer ownership of farmland is, is, is an important issue or, uh, to be concerned about. And third, that the benefits of ag payments, and this is just the way the market works, are going to be shared between producers and landowners. And that's an important point to understand in providing information about the beneficiaries of ag payments. And if you go through growing forward, you'll see the producer or the farmer is mentioned 66 times, but you won't see mention of landowners. So that's, that's my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Brady.